Okay, good afternoon. It's good to see everybody again this year. I think, uh, at least I hope, that we've all learned that hurricanes are all different. Uh, the tracks are different. The intensities are different. The forward motion is different. Uh, the structure, the radius of maximum winds, that's all different. Uh, the, uh, the sizes can, can be different, uh, how far out the tropical storm force winds, the hurricane force winds go. They're all different, and they all result in different impacts. And we're going to talk about some of those impacts here uh, today. Uh, Matthew had the biggest uh, impact, uh, certainly to the United States this year. Uh, there were three million people that evacuated uh, along the coastline for Matthew. The, uh, and over three and a half million people lost power. The Hurricane Center's tropical cyclone report uh, estimates $10 billion in total wind and water damages. Uh, that makes it the 10th most destructive hurricane uh, on record for the United States. And perhaps uh, more importantly, the, uh, the, there are 585 direct deaths. Uh, most of those, uh, over 500, were in Haiti. In the United States, uh, we had 34 direct deaths and 18 indirect deaths. So we're going to kind of set the stage here and actually for some other things that go on this afternoon. Uh, the last uh, panel discussion is going to be really good about how to communicate specific product. But we're going to start out in Florida and move our way northward uh, up into North Carolina. Uh, and here representatives from each of those states. Now, our first speaker uh, was scheduled to be uh, Brian Kuhn, the Director of Emergency Management for the Florida Division of Emergency Management. Uh, Brian uh, sent me an email yesterday saying that the governor had requested he uh, give a briefing today on the uh, over 100 wildfires in Florida, so uh, he couldn't make it. And I appreciate uh, Andrew Sussman filling in on short notice here. Andrew's been with uh, uh, Florida uh, Division of Emergency Management for nine years. The last six years, he's been the hurricane program manager. Uh, he was the catastrophic uh, planning uh, point of contact, and he co-coordinated the 2008 Emergency Management Accreditation Program uh, assessment for the state emergency response team. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and introduce all four. Uh, Andrew, of course, is from Florida. And from Georgia, we have Major General Thomas Moore, United States Air Force, retired. Uh, he serves as the Deputy Director of Emergency Management at the Georgia Emergency Management and Homeland Security Agency. Uh, Mr. Moore served five years as the Assistant Adjutant General for the Georgia National Guard, uh, where he supervised uh, the Georgia State Air Guard staff and uh, commanded 2,900 people in the Georgia uh, Air Guard. Uh, he had a 34-year military career, and he's built a reputation as an agile leader uh, with the ability to uh, bring diverse teams together in a uh, unified mission. Uh, moving up into South Carolina, uh, we're glad to have uh, Stephen Batson with us. Stephen serves currently as the Chief of Staff for the South Carolina Emergency Management Division, and uh, he's been with the division since 2001. Uh, except for a one-year break in service where he worked for the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division's Office of Homeland Security. Uh, his disaster operations experience include serving as the Deputy State Coordinating Officer for the 2014 Winter Storm, 2015 Severe Flooding Incident, and of course 2016's Hurricane Matthew. Now we have... Uh, from uh, North Carolina, we have, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling here. I can't see, I don't have any light up here. But uh, Mike uh, Deniska, he's the Assistant Acting Director for Planning and Homeland Security for the North Carolina Department of Public Safety and the Division of Emergency Management. He uh, has been in, with emergency management there since 2006. Uh, where he's been involved in a wide range of other programs, uh, many programs and activities that uh, uh, include Homeland Security Grants Manager, he's managed the state Homeland Security Strategy, a supervised implementation of a wide variety of uh, DHS programs in North Carolina, 
and uh, he supervised the emergency response planning for natural hazards and man-made threats. So with that, uh, let's turn this over to Andrew. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, so getting into it, um, as we know with what happened with Hurricane uh, Matthew last year, uh, Florida, um, overall, it, a lot of things went well. We definitely had some challenges, some lessons learned. Um, they discussed it with many folks. There was some striking similarities to how Hurricane Matthew behaved to how Hurricane Floyd behaved in 1999. Um, if you are a hurricane geek like me, uh, just to get into it, uh, it had a striking similarity to the track of Hurricane David in 1979, but uh, far more intense than uh, Hurricane David was. Um, so we had an ability to compare, uh, you know, things we learned from Hurricane Floyd in 1999 to be able to compare with Matthew. Uh, our warning, notification, messaging to the public uh, went very well. We were able to start messaging folks almost a week before Matthew started bothering Florida. Um, the improvements of the National Hurricane Center forecast almost allowed it to almost 10 days out, uh, watching it come off of Africa and intensify. I knew there was going to be a, a turn uh, towards Florida. Um, so there was many days uh, folks could start preparing. Uh, we were also very fortunate that this storm went to an area of Florida that given the strength and severity and size of that storm and the angle it was going, that side of Florida thankfully wasn't going to get the most dangerous conditions. Uh, Matthew would have been a much different story had it been in the Gulf, coming back to the Gulf side of Florida. <clears throat> the counties on the East Coast, uh, their evacuation clearance times were well with inside the 48 and 36 hour watch and warning uh, for Hurricane Matthew. So the counties there could wait till they got the, a lot of those wonderful products we're getting from the National Hurricane Center now, the storm surge flooding graphic, uh, being able to utilize the storm surge watch and warning, um, numerous conversations uh, with the National Hurricane Center on our, our 11-15-5-15 calls. Um, like I said, uh, we're very fortunate that Matthew did not go to the other, some of the other regions of Florida who has to start making evacuation decisions sometimes well outside of 48 hours. Overall, the damage uh, was mainly in coastal areas. Um, power restoration was able to go very quickly. Our business partners, our private sector partners were able to reopen very quickly in a lot of areas. Um, there were some challenges with sheltering, some lessons learned. Uh, we have our mass notification system uh, in the state of Florida. It, uh, it worked very well. Our counties, many of our counties have mass notification systems or we were able to support with our state system alert Florida. Um, so, like I said, the, the ability to warn the public, to get them to prepare, uh, went far better uh, than Hurricane Floyd 1999. Um, and if you remember in Hurricane Floyd, uh, there was reports that people were stuck on the road sometimes for almost up to 24 hours, not being able to move very far. Our traffic counter data on the state highways for Hurricane Matthew uh, showed most people during Hurricane Matthew the evacuation probably began uh, roughly two and a half days before hazardous conditions arrived and what was amazing was for most of it F Floridians were able to go the speed limit during the evacuation which if you've driven Florida that they rarely go the speed limit anyway um, but there were some roads uh, that you know our Florida Department of Transportation is looking at where there were some instances where they dropped to about half the speed limit uh, but overall it was a very very efficient evacuation uh, we still did have folks go further than they have to. You know, we always emphasize tens of miles, not hundreds of miles. You only have to run from the water, hide from the wind. Um, but we did unfortunately still have folks who went to Georgia, uh, went to the west coast of Florida. We, we still certainly encourage folks, you don't have to go that far to sometimes get away from these. Um, but in terms of our lessons learned, uh, it was really interesting to be able to compare, the, uh, compare this to Hurricane Floyd and know that we are, we are making tremendous strides uh, from lessons learned to previous storms. And while there's still challenges, we will, we will continue to work with those and be prepared for the next storm. So that's all I have. Thank you. How's everybody doing? All right. Uh, don't normally like to talk after lunch. Uh, I like to usually take a nap, but uh, I'm sure most of y'all can hang in here a little bit longer. Uh, I took the job of deputy director back in June and uh, thought I would have to deal with the occasional winter, winter storm and that would probably be about it. Uh, and little did I know that uh, we were gonna be dealing with uh, two hurricanes. Uh, Hermine certainly gave us a good run up for Matthew. Uh, what went well? 
Her meeting allowed us to continue to foster our relationships with external partners and within the SOC and heightened our level of awareness. And uh, some of the improvements that we made after that were we uh, institution institutionalized our synchronization matrix, which uh, is for an aviator like me is a checklist. And uh, we basically got together with all the ESFs uh, after the 2014 uh, ice storm that we had that uh, created a little bit of a problem for us. And, uh, came up with a synchronization matrix across the board starting at 120 hours for just about any situation that would occur. Uh, back in 2014, this little ice storm that we had that stranded hundreds of thousands of people uh, around Atlanta uh, actually taught us a lot of different lessons. Uh, leadership doesn't improve when the sky turns gray. So leadership changes, replacements were made throughout the agency. A chief of staff position was added to synchronize the many stovepipes of influence within the agency. A staff meteorologist was added uh, and hired uh, to backfill a position that had been vacant for years. A uh, communications manager's position was added in the operations division to oversee the state warning point and to manage tactical communications. And the executive leadership in other state agencies quickly became motivated to assist in planning development and to support the state plan. And the other thing that we learned was hire as much talent and experience as you can afford. Uh, so for Matthew, during the evacuation, what worked well and where did challenges exist? Well, uh, on Wednesday, October the 5th, the governor encouraged people to voluntarily leave. Uh, our biggest challenge was getting the governor's office uh, to actually believe that Matthew was going to impact our state. And uh, our synchronization matrix that we put together, you know, had 120 hours, had each step along the way for all the different state agencies, and we were all following it. Unfortunately, we hadn't briefed the governor's office on the state uh, synchronization matrix. And so they were thinking 36 hours, and we were thinking 120 hours. So finally convinced them on Friday, October the 7th, uh, to uh, go ahead and implement uh, an evacuation. And we did contraflow on I-16. It was the first time we'd done that since 1999. And I got to tell you, I thought it went extremely well. Uh, we were really proud of that. Now, uh, what didn't go well was that uh, Florida and South Carolina were on a 120-hour uh, plan. And they'd already declared a, uh, a state of emergency and had started their evacuations. Uh, well, when we went to evacuate, we didn't have any hotel rooms because Florida and South Carolina were in them all. So, lesson learned there. Um, as far as response, uh, prior planning uh, allowed us to do uh, quite a bit, uh, especially with the uh, contra flow. Um, this was the first time uh, we had done a re-entry operation ever by Georgia Emergency Management. And uh, we learned quite a bit from that um, due to the lack of debris. The other thing that we learned was that uh, your emergency managers work for uh, city managers and mayors. And uh, when, we, when we started a re-entry process, we had a plan, but uh, the mayors and the emergency managers uh, decided that because of the lack of debris, that they would go ahead and speed that plan up. That kind of threw us a, a monkey wrench there into our reentry task force procedures. Uh, lesson learned there as well. Recovery challenges. Uh, the delivery model used uh, the uh, program delivery managers, uh, site inspectors, task force leaders, and a slew of folks at the CRC who all had to learn their new roles and responsibilities uh, initially, there were some growing pains um, with this, but shortly uh, after, the system kicked in, and I will say that uh, 4294 and 4297, which were the tornadoes that we had uh, in January, have gone much more smoothly. And so the new system is a good system. Um, anybody got any questions for me? I guess we'll take questions at the end, too. I'll turn, it over. I'll, I'll turn the remaining time over to uh, my friend from the great state of South Carolina. Sorry about those hotel rooms. Uh, we did fill them up. 
Um, yeah. For those of you here last year, I had the opportunity to talk about the uh, Hurricane Joaquin and low-pressure system that interacted with our state and caused severe flooding in October of, of 15. Uh, little did I know I'd be standing up here again talking about the October 16 event that, uh, that hit with Matthew. Um, should have, yep, there's a PowerPoint slide and clicker is supposed to be up here somewhere. There we go. Um, just a little bit of uh, slides to, to kind of help and assist with the conversation. Basically, I uh, wanted to kind of start with uh, the purpose of state level emergency management, particularly in South Carolina, is to stress the word coordinate. We are not a command and control facility. Uh, when folks walk into our, into our room, they might get that feeling. It kind of has that uh, NORAD type feel to it that, you know, this is where the decisions are being made. This is the Stadio C when it's not fully staffed up. But for Matthew, uh, I tried to cram 200, 250 people into this room, add uh, FEMA uh, vehicles in the parking lot and state agencies bringing Winnebago's over to work out for additional space. And you kind of get a feel for, for what coordination takes, even for a small state like South Carolina. So with that, how do you coordinate this? You know, looking at the size and scale of Matthew, a storm very similar to, to Floyd in approach, moving its way, ultimately making landfall in South Carolina and falling apart over South Carolina and North Carolina and dropping a majority of its rain uh, as, it, as it did so, uh, cr created a whole host of challenges for us. How do you lead, how do you coordinate in an environment where there's this much force cast uncertainty? Uh, if you look anywhere within that air cone is a storm that could stay well out to sea uh, with no impacts uh, all the way to a possible direct hit to our most vulnerable area in the, in the Beaufort County area where almost the, well, the entire county is within an evacuation zone because of the, the low elevation. And if you're talking Beaufort County, you're talking Hilton Head and all those, those additional barrier islands in and around that area. It's, a, it's not an easy place to get out of, and there's not a direct interstate system to get you out of there. So you've got a lot of forecast uncertainty and a lot of risk, and it takes a lot of time and a coordinated effort to get folks out of harm's way. Again, as was said earlier, we, we run from storm surge. We try to hide from the wind. So with those National Weather Service products, we love our, our National Weather Service partners and the National Hurricane Center uh, working directly with both offices. We get that direct transition uh, or translation of products into actions. Uh, and I want to peel back the curtain just a little bit in terms of how do you do this. With South Carolina, we're a little unique in that only our governor has the authority to, do, uh, to issue a full uh, jurisdiction-wide evacuation. Our fire chiefs within the within the state have some localized evacuation authority. It is not done county by county like Florida, Georgia, and, and others. So we have to do this in a coordinated fashion. Uh, the governor is not going to step out and, and over Trump a, uh, a local authority. So we have to make sure that we're on the same page, we're, we're in agreement, and we know what it is that we're dealing with. So. You get the long text messages and the graphics from the National Hurricane Center, and, the, and we learned from the severe flood in 15 that having an NWS liaison in our EOC is absolutely critical. So if that's not part of your plans, I encourage you, that's a definitely a best practice for us. You don't want to necessarily have your, your governor or your emergency management director having to be the official weather spokesman on, on the television uh, during a news conference. You know, defer to the expertise and uh, allow the National Weather Service to, to help you with that in, in its descriptions. But with a liaison in our office, each time the Hurricane Center would come out with a product, we asked them to score that product based on one of the four scenarios that you see here. And this is what we were dealing with, with the potential vulnerability. A storm that could stay out at sea with no problems, uh, all the way up to scenario four with a, a direct hit, basically, with up to or even maybe exceeding six to eight feet of storm surge. These were on the table. This is what we were trying to protect against. And this is what we had to coordinate with our 46 counties in our state, but primarily with our, our nine coastal counties or inland counties that uh, are, are near the river systems that would definitely be impacted by storm surge. So each time, every six hours, when a product would come out, we'd turn over to John Coelho, John Q, easier. Uh, we'd turn to John Q and say, hey, John, 
what's the percentage of uh, the likelihood of scenario one or two or three? And we'd write his, what he would, uh, how he would translate that. Sometimes he'd need a minute to think about it. Uh, but we'd ask him to, to basically rate, based on this advisory, if what, which scenario was changing, which one was increasing, which one was most likely to happen. So not only did we have the individual products, but over time on a whiteboard we could track where this storm was, was trending. Because if you know when, you've, when you're now on a 72 hours, very little sleep, and trying to, to stay abreast of each of the updates, you can kind of lose track of where you are in the cycle. But being able to go back and look at the, the board and say, okay, where are we trending? What's, what's, what's happening here? It also helps you identify where there's some, some shifts. Something's happened, the storm's moved, it's changing the way that we could need to respond. Ultimately, when it came time to, for, to make a decision for that protective action recommendation of evacuation of our coastal zones, those the most vulnerable to storm surge based on the scenario we're gonna deal with, we were looking at a scenario three type environment. Now at the same time that we're making this, we're, we're dealing with a storm that is still, it's not making direct landfall with Florida yet. We're, we're dealing with a storm that's still very far out. Our clearance times in South Carolina can go as high as 40 to 48 hours of time that it takes to get the last car out of harm's way. And then to add a couple hours on the back end of that to get the first responders out of the way. It's an incredible amount of time to make all this happen. So dealing with a lot of uncertainty, dealing with percentages and probabilities and really fine tuning where we were as the storm approached, we used that to make our evacuation decisions. And what you see here are the zones that did evacuate. Ultimately, we were able to delay a little bit in our northern conglomerate in uh, Horry County, the Myrtle Beach area. Based on the storm's speed and track, we were able to slow that down a bit. But uh, our zone A's and zone A and B in the southern conglomerate, and because of the complexity in the Charleston area, uh, a lot of additional zones around the rivers is basically what you're, we're seeing there. Equating to the population of about half a million. 500,000 people asked by the governor to please leave your home, pack up, and get out of harm's way. And, and please do that because we won't be able to come and get you when this storm hits. It's a sunny day in South Carolina, and we're having to make that call. That's a tough call, and it's one you have to have uh, everybody in agreement with, and that's the main role of the state EOC, is coordinating with our coastal counties and the receiving counties on the sheltering side to be able to manage that type of a load. In terms of timing, when it all happened, who was moving, what was, what was going on, you, you basically see that October 4 and 5 timeline of when we were moving and, and when key actions were taking place and some of the times. Over 400 DPS, National Guard, and, and other law enforcement entities manning our evacuation routes, and we did a full reversal of I-26. And mentioned Hurricane Hugo, or Hurricane Floyd, rather. Hurricane Floyd and this storm were so very similar, and Floyd was not a good experience for South Carolina. Uh, that was one where we definitely uh, took our lumps, and with Hurricane Matthew, we're, we're, we're at least feeling a little better. We've got a lot more confidence behind us now that we didn't have another Floyd. We, we had cars evacuating on the reverse lanes of I-26 coming out of Charleston, traveling over 70 miles an hour. That's a, that's a good evacuation, I'll take that. Uh, that's, that's one of our measures of success. We'll talk about in, the, in tomorrow's session a little bit about the challenges of the transportation needy and the need to get buses down and, and get folks out of the way. Also, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to this till, till tomorrow, uh, but unless there's questions. Sheltering. Uh, a lot of shelters, one of our biggest shelter missions with over 6,000 sheltered, plus all those hotel rooms that we talked about, uh, there wasn't a, a, an empty hotel in the entire state. And initially there was some hesitation to pull that evacuation order or to, to issue it for fear of what it would do to tourism in the hotel industry. Well, the coast may have suffered, but the rest of the state benefited. Uh, so kind of take that into account. Special medical needs shelters and pet shelters, all areas where we had a, a lot of deficiencies in the severe flood, we saw a lot of improvements in Hurricane Matthew. But still, there's, there's room for improvement there, and, and the staffing piece is really the, the biggest challenge. So as the storm makes landfall, we've gotten as many people as we can out of the way. We think our compliance rates were somewhere around half. Half chose to evacuate. So if we asked half a million to leave, we, somewhere around 200 to 250,000 folks chose to heed that warning. We're worried about the, those that, that chose to stay. 
Now, I think part of that is the news footage coming out of Florida was folks walking along the beach. There was maybe one footage of a shingle flying through the air or a palm branch skirting across the ground. That was the images coming out of Florida when it came time for that crunch hour of should our family leave or not. Folks saw a glancing storm. Folks saw one that was maybe decreasing in, in speed and, and losing some of its intensity and made the decision to stay. That's going to impact us the next time we have to make a decision. Uh, rainfalls that you saw, you know, we, in 15 we saw rainfalls of 23 and 25 inches. With Matthew we saw rainfalls in the 13 and 14 inches, but it's where it fell and its concentration, and particularly a lot of the water that fell in North Carolina drained into South Carolina through the Lumber River. And I'll show you some pictures of a community that was devastated by that. But wind, uh, you'll see a lot of the storm surge effects down in the Hilton Head, Edisto Island area. I've got a, a picture or two of that. And then the, the rainfall and flooding in the PD region uh, further inland as a direct of all the rain is what we had to deal with. So just a quick synopsis of kind of some of the major muscle movements associated with a hurricane response. You got 5,000 calls to the highway patrol asking for assistance. That's motorists in, in trouble in some way or another. You've got 2,009 or 2,950 National Guards on active duty and working the storm, primarily in the evacuation role, and then additional health and safety areas and other missions that we, we, we lie, depend upon them very much for. Uh, lots of other statistics there, but for sake of time, I need to move on. A big kudos for our utility folks, uh, over 860,000 outages. There's about 4.6, 4.7 million citizens in South Carolina. So to put that in perspective, you know, almost a, a quarter of our state was without power. Uh, but we saw quick restoration rates and times as we moved through. The main problems we had were where substations were in flood zones. And we, we had to, uh, the utilities had to uh, route electricity around those substations in order to get the power back on. And we had to wait for flood waters to recede. Oh, sorry, move the wrong direction. So that's a DNR official there uh, standing next to a mailbox. That's typically not where you put your mailbox. So kind of give you a feel for the sand that was pushed inland as the dunes were hit by storm surge and then pushed inland. Uh, that's the second street back in the Beaufort, uh, or actually in Edisto area. Uh, so you get a feel for how much sand and raw material was moved as a result of that. That's a debris management issue and, and cleanup in that is fun. Our river flooding that, that happened as well. And the need to evacuate before the floodwaters come is illustrated there by the evacuation route being completely underwater. It's not time to evacuate after the storm has hit. Governor Haley is our, was our champion at the time. Uh, keep an eye on her. You'll see her in the news quite a bit at the, as she's serving as an ambassador, but uh, she is definitely one to watch and a, a great ally of emergency management for us in South Carolina. Just did a phenomenal job in, in forcing her cabinet agencies to come to the state EOC and coordinate directly because that's where she chose to set up base of operations for the three weeks uh, pre and post impact of that storm. Our director's there in the center and just kind of give you a feel for some of the coordination roles that can take place in the EOC. It's just an ad hoc meeting with our chief of ops there in the EOC as we're moving through the operation. Our, our big impact though is in the town of Nichols, an entire town, mostly senior citizens, mostly retired, fixed income, uh, limited income, uh, L, you know, very high LMI population. The, all businesses underwater, all homes underwater, the entire town underwater. The town was in financial jeopardy prior to the storm, or not jeopardy, but Jeff definitely having some tight times. And now just trying to make payroll each week is, is still a challenge for the town of Nichols. And uh, we're still trying to provide as much assistance as we can, community disaster loan programs. There's efforts at the state legislature to try to push some state funding down to help just this little, this little town try to recover. But this is, this, this is a face of, of Matthew in terms of some of the major impacts that we had. How do you rebuild an entire town? And a real challenge for us. And FEMA's been working with us just is bending over backwards to try to help in any way they can in, in terms of helping this town and, and, our, and our state to recover. EMAC, a whole lot of EMAC. Many of you probably here provided or sent somebody with us to help us. We thank you. As far away as Alaska came and assisted, uh, and just tons of resources that, that we were you know, very quick to ask for was the main reason why it was successful. 
We're looking at a disaster that on the individual assistance side is about a $39 million, $39 million event, uh, $59 million in SBA loans and $150 million in national flood insurance program payments, and $362 million in the PA side. So we had a big ice storm in 14 that was 250 million, the severe flood over 300 million, and then you add Matthew, 362 million. We've got about a billion dollars worth of disaster damage in our state. And keep in mind, we hadn't had a disaster since 2005. So we went nine years without anything, and now year after year after year, we've been hit to the tune of a, a billion dollars worth. The state share on this disaster alone is, is up in the 90, 90 million dollar range. And, we're a small state who doesn't have $90 million sitting around. Uh, key factors, early decision making, getting ahead of this thing, not, not playing catch up, and certainly senior leadership involvement at the front end of it was just was cr crucial. Uh, use of EMAC, can't stress that enough. Ask early, because it does take a while to get them in. Think about what you'll need before you need it, and then and go ahead and make that request. National Guard, can't stress them enough, a great help to us. Uh, if, you, if you're not involved in your planning, particularly at the local level, get to know your National Guard unit leaders there on the ground and find out what capabilities they can bring. We still got some of these same where areas to improve are very similar to what we saw in the severe flood previously. Information validation is tough. Rumor gets out, social media gets posted, something is out there, the bridge is gone. Is it gone? I don't know if it's gone. Can somebody get out there and look to find if the bridge is gone? Well, you spend a lot of time chasing down those types of information nodes that come in that you've, you've got to verify if you're going to move forward and, and alter your operation as a result of them. I'll hit those as the highlights and uh, to turn it over to Mike for North Carolina. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, my name is Mike Daniska. I'm the assistant director for uh, planning and homeland security in North Carolina. And uh, so I'm going to talk about a uh, high level overview of uh, response and recovery efforts in North Carolina for Hurricane Matthew. And um, just sitting here listening for uh, uh, past 20, 30 minutes to the other states, to me it's kind of uh, interesting just to hear the different perspectives uh, from each state. So mine's very high level, but uh, before I get into Matthew, I, I thought it was kind of important to kind of set the stage for uh, what North Carolina was involved in before Matthew uh, actually impacted us. Uh, we did spin up a little bit for Hermine. Uh, Tropical Storm Hermine was not a huge event for North Carolina. But later in September, uh, we had a series of events uh, along with the other states in the southeastern part of the U.S. Uh, we had the Colonial Pipeline Disruption event, uh, so our state EOC activated for that. And then unfortunately, uh, that same week, there was uh, an officer-involved shooting in Charlotte, uh, which led to violent protests and, and riots. And then also that week, we had uh, the remnants of Tropical Storm Julia, and uh, we didn't have uh, direct impacts uh, from the storm itself, but the remnants actually caused major flooding over the northeastern part of the state. Uh, so we basically were activated in our EOC for three concurrent events. And then just when we thought things were winding down, the following week, uh, we, we were demobilizing the state EOC for those activities. Uh, we actually had a, just, just a regular rainstorm uh, in the central part of the state dump about 6 to 10 inches, uh, flooding central North Carolina. Um, that was especially significant because when Matthew came through, uh, the heaviest rain bands were, again, along that central North Carolina corridor. So uh, that rain the week before really uh, led to significant flooding for Matthew. So while we're watching all of those events in the state EOC, while we're active, activated for those events, the, uh, we're also keeping an eye out in the tropics. And uh, so every shift brief we're having for these other events, uh, our, our weather team is also keeping us up to date. And uh, we can see this depression, the system, gradually moving across the Atlantic, heading our way. And we got this bad feeling about it. And uh, you know, then we, we see it start to make the turn. And of course, the, the forecasts and the projections come in, and, and uh, we all know what happened after that. So when Matthew impacted the state, uh, this is just a visualization of some of the impacts or the, uh, uh, the wide geographic scope of the impacts. Um, the picture in the top left is from our National Weather Service Raleigh office. 
Uh, and just for that office, they, they show that we had uh, five river basins or five sites along those rivers uh, that had record flooding from Matthew. There were also a lot of uh, river basins that, that were at major flood stage or uh, flood stage. So we, we've heard uh, some talk from the other uh, panelists about uh, comparing Matthew to Floyd and you know, kind of the historical significance. And uh, Floyd was, up, up till Matthew, Floyd was definitely the, the storm of record for North Carolina. Uh, Floyd was a major event for North Carolina, uh, but geographically, Floyd was actually smaller than Matthew. Uh, the thing that got us with Matthew was that it, it hit all of those major river basins uh, in the central and the eastern part of the state, so the geographic impact was much larger. Uh, very high-level overview of some of our state emergency response team actions. Uh, we had over 1,500 resource requests that came into the state EOC that were approved. Uh, over 1,100 National Guard soldiers were activated for the event. And, uh, you know, I can't speak highly enough of, uh, of our National Guard soldiers and National Guard soldiers just in general. In North Carolina, uh, they are a huge part of, uh, of our state emergency response team. Uh, they bring a lot of people to the fight, a lot of resources to the fight, uh, so we, we could not be successful without them. We had over 2,300 rescues were conducted. Uh, most of these were by Swiftwater boat crews. Um, we did have uh, Hilo aquatic rescues. They're the, the 90 by aircraft. Uh, and those 12 aircraft that did those, those rescues were National Guard aircraft. Uh, six mobile kitchen sites were deployed, serving over 400,000 meals. And it's technically not a uh, state response. Uh, obviously, it's federal. Uh, but I just wanted to mention the great partnership we had with FEMA. Uh, they established an incident support base at Fort Bragg, uh, which is in Cumberland County. And it's probably kind of hard to see on the map, uh, but in those, those big uh, red and uh, purple blotches kind of scattered across North Carolina, uh, Cumberland County is uh, in one of those red and purple ones. So that, that was where a lot of the precipitation came down. And that map uh, in the upper right, that's actually showing um, within a 24-hour period uh, historical significance of rainfall. So the really dark purple is a 500 to 1,000 year rain event. Uh, you get down into the, the lighter purple and the red, you're talking uh, 200 to 500 uh, kind of year rains events. But still, um, we, we hadn't seen that kind of rain in North Carolina in a long time. Very significant amount of rain coming in a very short period of time. Um, another thing that's important to mention is the emergency fuel contract that we activated. That's actually something um, earlier in 2016 had just come into place uh, to have emergency fuel contract uh, for public safety response needs. So we actually first activated that during the Colonial Pipeline event. Little did we know we would be activating it again just a few weeks later for Matthew. Um, the picture that's here, that's actually showing the, uh, the contractor uh, along our uh, coastal county of Currituck, uh, taking fuel out to a Viper, which is our statewide interoperable communication system, taking that out to a Viper tower site. Um, and that was really critical because when the power went down uh, throughout much of, of North Carolina, uh, a lot of our statewide interoperable communication tower sites were on backup generator power. Uh, but after a few days of being on backup generator power, obviously they're, they're starting to run out of fuel. Uh, so that, that was a, a key uh, response measure that had to be undertaken was to actually deliver uh, fuel to those generators at our communication sites. Um, just a high level of a review of uh, county actions, uh, 40, 40 of our county EOCs activated, uh, a large number were monitoring the situation, 46 county states of emergency. Um, we, unlike the other states uh, that, that have spoken um, uh, today, we didn't do any mass coastal evacuations. Um, you know, I think a big part of that was obviously the main impacts we had were further inland. We were getting prepared to do it, but we did not actually do any mass coastal evacuations. Um, also, just, just unique maybe to North Carolina a little bit, um, in our state, our governor has the statutory uh, authority to order a mass coastal evacuation, but uh, I'm not aware historically North Carolina ever doing that. Traditionally, we coordinate with our counties, and it's our counties who are making those decisions to evacuate. So uh, we did have some evacuations off the coast. Um, Ocracoke Island, uh, which is kind of on the uh, far end of the Outer Banks and the map above the, uh, the, the text there, uh, part of Hyde County, they, they did a uh, mandatory evacuation for visitors. 
We did have some more uh, voluntary evacuations along the coast, but most of the evacuations that we had were further inland, uh, communities that were being impacted by river rain flooding. So looking at the impacts, um, unfortunately we had 28 storm, uh, storm fatalities in North Carolina. Um, a large number of those were actually people driving around barricades uh, at roads that were flooded out. Uh, so it's sad to say a lot of those storm fatalities probably could have been avoided if, uh, if people had just turned around and not, not tried to cross. Forty dams were impacted. Um, that includes everything from overtopping to uh, partial breaches to breaches. Uh, over 600 roads impacted. A lot of our major highways for a, a short time period were cut off due to flooding. Uh, and a lot of our secondary roads were impacted too. Uh, 100 shelters opened with 4,000 occupants. And the thing that I, I think was a, um, uh, a big uh, kind of an eye-opener for us was the length of time that our shelters had to stay open. The, uh, the last shelter didn't close um, until November 14th. And uh, when I talk about recovery a little bit, I'll, I'll talk about uh, transitional sheltering uh, assistance. But, um, you know, we had people who were in, some people who were in shelters up to five weeks, and uh, I think that's, that's the longest we've seen in North Carolina. Uh, numerous water systems were impacted. Uh, we had some major water main breaks uh, down in the, the southeastern part of the state. So it was kind of, it was interesting, you know, we're dealing with all the flooding, we're dealing with all the rain, we're deal dealing with all these infrastructure impacts, all of these things that are uh, caused by the rain and water and precipitation. And we came very close to having a situation in the southeastern part of the state due to a water main break, they, they almost were facing a water shortage uh, after going through a hurricane. So we, we sent down commodities, uh, bottled water to uh, pre-stage it just in case they needed it. Fortunately, they were able to get it back up and running, but uh, that was also kind of kind of serene. On the one hand, all this flooding, and on the other hand, a water shortage. Um, 800,000 plus customers were without power. Um, reiterate, reiterating what uh, Stephen from South Carolina said, you know, I think the utilities did an incredible job getting the power back up. The graph there shows uh, kind of the trend line we saw, the peak uh, coming up around the 9th of October, uh, that would have been Sunday, and then it trails off. So within three, four days, uh, the utilities were able to get most of the power back on to customers. Um, the ones that were uh, difficult or the ones that stayed off the longest, typically they were areas where uh, it was very hard to get to. Um, the, the utility crews, due to the flooding, they couldn't reach them. So uh, we had uh, riverine flooding for about two weeks. Uh, the last river went below flood stage October 24th. 50 counties declared for public assistance, 45 for individual assistance, uh, estimated $1.5 billion in property damage, uh, estimated 106,000 structures with water, at least the foundation. And those are actually older estimates. Uh, I haven't actually updated that in the past few months. That, those numbers may have actually gone up. Um, obviously, when you have all this infrastructure impact, uh, a lot of the school systems were impacted, and then we also had impacts to uh, air transportation. So um, looking at what worked well and uh, lessons learned, and um, you, know, you probably couldn't fit in uh, several slides all the things that, that worked well or uh, corrective action items that we need to identify, but I, I tried to hit some highlights here. Um, I, I think the biggest thing that I can speak to is, you know, again, before Matthew, Floyd was really the, the storm of event for North Carolina. So over the past uh, 17, 18 years, a lot of the uh, resource development that we focused on has been uh, preparing for another major uh, flooding hurricane type event. So we built a lot of capabilities, a lot of lessons learned from Floyd were implemented during Matthew. Um, our Joint Information Center, uh, our state PIOs, they were getting taxed throughout the event, trying to respond to a lot of the information requests coming in. Uh, so we actually had some county emergency management staff come in and plug right into our state PIO and JIC. Uh, they did an awesome job supporting PIO operations. All hazard incident management teams worked very well. Uh, in North Carolina, uh, we have, um, I think it's about 300 uh, predominantly local uh, county folks around the state that are credentialed plans, ops, logistics, PIO, different uh, positions, uh, EOC overhead team. So we actually pulled a lot of those folks from western North Carolina who were not being impacted and plugged them into central and eastern North Carolina into the county EOCs uh, to help backfill our county partners who were 
uh, really being stressed to the max uh, with, with all of the, the response that was needed. Um, Co-location of the National Guard at our State EOC. So in North Carolina, um, our State EOC and our Emergency Management Agency, uh, we are actually in the same building as our National Guard. So that makes it very easy for us to coordinate and communicate. But just being co-located, you know, that's not enough. Actually having our National Guard partners in the State EOC in our command room was huge. Um, they, we could communicate with them. They would hear uh, the missions that needed to be filled. They could talk about the capabilities they had, the mission-ready packages. So that kind of dialogue was really critical. EMAC uh, was also important. And I uh, just want to say thank you to, uh, to Mississippi and uh, Tennessee and uh, Virginia uh, for, for the EMAC assets that came in. I thought it was important to mention the uh, Virginia IMT that came in. Um, I think they were actually on their way back up from Florida, I think. They, they were coming from somewhere south of us. But anyway, they were passing through North Carolina, and uh, uh, our deputy uh, director uh, commandeered them a bit and uh, brought them into the state EOC. Uh, but they, they basically plugged in with our division field staff and our counties in the eastern part of the state, and using some of the, some of the technology that I'll get to in a second, um, we're looking at the projected flood areas um, as all that water was coming back down the river and coordinating and communicating with our county emergency management partners uh, to begin pre-staging or, or moving commodities and resources uh, strategically so once the waters came through and potentially cut off a city or county, we'd have resources and commodities in the right place. Uh, and also our business EOC, um, I don't know if she's here this afternoon, but uh, Persia Payne Hurley is our business EOC coordinator, and um, she's been working on that for the past couple of years. And this is the first time she, she has actually implemented the BOC, B, business EOC model. And um, she'll talk about it in more detail, I think, in a session tomorrow. But uh, that's another thing that I think worked really well in her ability to coordinate with the private sector partners, those relationships she had facilitated over time, and connect them to the unmet needs that were being identified. And then Feynman Flood Maps and Analysis. That's our uh, flood inundation mapping and alert network. Uh, this is another thing that's been developed over the years uh, since Hurricane Floyd. But basically, we've got river gauges throughout the state. And that's what you can see in the bottom left uh, image. And so we can see pretty much real time the direction the rivers are going in terms of flooding. Is, are the flood waters rising? Are they going down? Are they steady? Uh, we can also kind of see the projection of where they're going to be. And then we overlay that with uh, the building footprints. We've, we've collected about um, two or three million building footprints in the state. Uh, and we can also do some projections on where the waters are going to be. So we can overlay those build, building footprints uh, with projections of where the flood waters are going to be and start seeing the kind of impacts that, that might be experienced. And the other thing that uh, that can do is those buildings have dollar amounts attached to them. So we can start getting some early uh, estimates of uh, potential financial impacts from the flooding. So lessons learned, uh, Gumby plan, that's something our uh, deputy director came up with during Arthur when we had to shift some stuff around. But um, you know, really stay flexible as far as resource deployment. Um, I think we've heard over the past couple of days talking about storm tracks and experiences with Matthew. And obviously for North Carolina, uh, the, the track was uh, Pretty, pretty difficult at times because it shifted west, it shifted east. Um, but when we were originally gearing up for it, we had sent a lot of resources down to the eastern part of the state because we thought the heaviest impacts were going to be in the southeast part of North Carolina. As we saw the rain bands and the projections begin to shift further central uh, and west, uh, we had to redeploy those assets. So uh, being able to stay flexible in whatever kind of plan or resource de deployment you have, I think that's key. Uh, reunification of families following rescue. So that, that's something our uh, emergency service, uh, Swift Water Rescue guys, identified. And so, as I mentioned, they did over 2,300 rescues. And uh, as quick as they plucked somebody out, they were right back into the fight trying to rescue people. Um, but something in North Carolina we've identified, something we need to work on, is to track those people who have been rescued um, specifically for family reuni reunification. Uh, trying to connect people who've, who've been uh, rescued. Um, shelter training for staff. So pro probably like in a lot of states, uh, North Carolina, American Red Cross is a huge partner for us as far as shelters. And um, early on, when a lot of the impacts were looking like they were going to be south of North Carolina, uh, a lot of our trained ARC people uh, went down and, and, and started helping out down there. 
Um, that was really good to help other states. And, and unfortunately, some of our state partners who were kind of backfilling that, uh, we had a little bit of a uh, training deficit. So that, that's something we've identified as far as uh, training for shelter staff. And then Viper, which I mentioned, is our statewide communication system. Um, early on in the response, we had some uh, busy signals, which shouldn't happen. Uh, again, this goes back to, I think we heard the, uh, the mayor talking about 9-11 and communications. So um, we had some busy signals with our statewide interop communication system. And that was not because the system was being overtaxed. Uh, it had to do with being able to uh, appropriately uh, assign talk groups and channels. So one of the things that we identified was maybe pre-deploying communication unit, unit overhead teams uh, in advance of the, of the event who were empowered to assign those talk groups. And then related to communications, um, some of the roads that were impassable uh, prevent some of that needed equipment getting down range. So we talked about pre-deploying comms equipment. And then uh, the last one I have on there, um, better tracking of rental equipment. So I was talking with our logistics chief and uh, as far as all the trailers of commodities and everything that got sent down, um, I, I know for a fact we got 100% of everything back, uh, but, but one of the things our logistics section identified was uh, apparently uh, tracking rental equipment was, was a challenge. So uh, knowing where it is, how much it costs, and uh, how long it's been out there is important. So uh, after Matthew, then we had Colonial Pipeline number two. Unfortunately, it was the explosion down Alabama. Uh, fortunately, they were able to get that back up pretty quickly. And then our state EOC stayed activated uh, through early December for our Western North Carolina fires. I know Tennessee was uh, hit very hard for that too, and I, th I think Georgia and some other states as well. Um, just real quick, the, uh, the Forest Service graph in the bottom left just kind of shows you the abnormality in terms of uh, that kind of fire from North Carolina. That's a 10-year uh, average for every November for the past 10 years, and the giant red graph is 2016. So that was uh, another big event. So for recovery, um, this is, uh, is going to be a long, a long slog, I think, uh, the recovery. Um, we have a state disaster recovery task force. They're meeting to address uh, unmet needs that have been identified. Edgecombe, Cumberland, Robinson County are some counties in central and eastern part of the state that have been particularly hit hard. Federal funding, state funding has come into play. We also have a variety of programs. Uh, the Matthew Disaster Recovery and Resiliency Initiative. That's a partnership with our UNC school system, the university system, uh, matching the uh, staff that they have there who are experts in recovery planning and matching them with communities throughout the state that uh, were impacted by Matthew and may not have the capacity uh, to rebuild or, or uh, will also need to be rebuilding in a resilient way, so trying to match the two together. Um, we had 34 disaster recovery centers open at the peak, or open total, 20 at the peak. And then the uh, transition sheltering assistance. Um, so we still have 193 households in transition shelter assistance. So housing and sheltering, or, or permanent housing, uh, is a key focus for our recovery efforts. So uh, what worked well for recovery? Um, expedited disaster declaration allowed for counties to be declared for public assistance without having to complete damage assessments. Uh, so very quickly, counties were declared uh, throughout the process. But it was kind of interesting because, um, you know, you may have a cluster of counties, you know, almost like a ring, and they're all kind of get, getting declared. And then you have that county in the middle, uh, the donut hole, so to say, and uh, it hasn't been declared yet. So just something to be mindful about, you know, when that happens. You know, you may get calls from congressional representatives, uh, state legislators, and you just have to explain, you know, the process takes time. Um, enhanced mitigation plan status. So because we do have uh, an enhanced plan in North Carolina, uh, that, that means about $25 million extra uh, for hazard mitigation projects. And then survivors receiving individual, individual assistance funds almost immediately. So th this is another one, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people in North Carolina, it was kind of unique. The, um, leading up to the storm, you know, October 3rd through the 7th, the storm impact, 8, 9, 10, and then we're dealing with flooding for two weeks after that. So for us, it was really about a, a three-week prep and, and response kind of, kind of event, and recovery was happening almost immediately after the storm had gone off the coast. 
So we had a lot of recovery activities happening simultaneously with response, uh, which I had not seen before uh, in our state. But while, while we're stu still doing all those response activities, uh, FEMA and, and, and our state uh, recovery staff are doing an excellent job uh, of getting out and getting people registered and actually getting money out the door. Um, some of the things that could be improved, again, going back to the housing, you know, I think before Hurricane Matthew hit, North Carolina had uh, an issue with affordable housing. Uh, after Matthew hit, it, it was just extremely magnified, and, and that's why we still see, uh, unfortunately, 193 households uh, in TSA. And then, uh, it's not really a, a lesson learned, but just a note, um, the majority of the impacted communities uh, from Matthew, North Carolina, um, they're small, they're rural, they don't have a lot of capacity, tax base-wise, uh, capability-wise. So, you know, really the ones who would need the help the most are the ones who got hit, and that's one of the challenges that we're currently facing. All right, and that's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Let's give the speakers a hand. Uh, we do have uh, two microphones down here. If you have any questions you'd like to um, ask any of our presenters, and um, uh, if you all have other comments after listening to each other, feel free to make those too. I'll, before you come up here, I'll share one, and, or while you're thinking about a question perhaps, I'll share one story from where I sat in South Florida. Uh, you know, Matthew had been a Category 5 in the Caribbean. It was a Category 4 it was at, uh, as it passed within 50 or 60 or so miles of the Florida East Coast, the very uh, populated, uh, even the Southeast Coast there. And, and again, from where I sit, and I'm at a local TV station now, I thought overall the system worked pretty well. I mean, you would think Florida would be able to, should be able to respond well, to prepare well for a hurricane. And the, uh, you know, I didn't think that for the most part the media overdid it. I and mean, we tried to get the messages out from the National Weather Service and from emergency management. I thought the uh, local emergency managers and the local officials uh, did an outstanding job. They, uh, they didn't uh, panic anyone, I don't think. They uh, held uh, frequent press conferences and got their a uh, clear message out on, uh, you know, putting shutters up and whether to evacuate or not. And I even wrote a note to the, uh, the county emergency managers uh, saying, I, you know, I thought they did a really good job. And then there was an article published in the Sun Sentinel newspaper by one of the mayors uh, sort of saying the same thing. I mean, he thought the, uh, overall the government officials did a really good job, and, and, and they did. Uh, but then he said that the reason that the, the residents in South Florida did not, did not have uh, heavy damage and loss of life is because they heeded the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, messages from uh, the local officials. Well, no, the reason they didn't have loss of life and uh, a lot of damage is because the core of the hurricane stayed just off the coast. So before we pat ourselves in the back too much, I think uh, you know, it, it makes a huge difference if you have a paralleling storm as opposed to one coming in perpendicular to the coastline. Uh, any questions, feel free to come up to the mic. Uh, uh, if not, I've got one. You know, a lot of places, in fact, I think most places probably make the evacuation decisions uh, for storm surge on a county by county basis, but it's not done like that uh, the same. I mean, some places uh, uh, with that uh, home, independent home rule, uh, you know, each community does their own thing. Uh, and I think I'll ask Steve here because I believe uh, South Carolina does it uh, differently with the governor having authority there. But uh, let me ask uh, if I can have, you know, we've I've been to uh, training sessions already and I've heard. Uh, uh, some real success stories on the graphics coming out of the National Weather Service now. Uh, it, it, we're primarily focused on getting that message to the public, and I heard uh, a, a mention of uh, even convincing the governors and you know your own local officials. Tell us how you make that storm surge evacuation decision in South Carolina, how you coordinate that, and if there are any specific graphics that helped you, you all make that decision. 
Sure. So definitely focusing on those National Hurricane Center products is, is, is very helpful. Uh, hosting teleconferences as well uh, as each of those come out, discussing them with our na local National Weather Service partners is, and, and going through that as a group, deliberating what does it mean, what does it not mean, what is this trending towards, how is this a, different from the previous uh, advisory and talking through that process continually. That means a, a lot of conference calls. We spend a lot of time pre-landfall, in some cases maybe wearing ourselves out pre-landfall to keep that consensus going, make sure we're on the same page and and that's a, you know, coordinating directly with our county partners and county partners doing a lot of conference calls with their municipalities and relaying that information back as well uh, so that we've got cities, towns, counties, and state all on the same page in terms of what we think we're dealing with, what we think we should do, and when it comes time to make that decision, uh, it, it's, it's simply laying out the case before the governor saying this is what we've got, this is the consensus that we have, this is why we need to evacuate, these are where our vulnerable populations reside, this is the potential storm surge that could come and impact them. And if, you, if you've worked it for the three or four or five days leading up to that evacuation decision, it's, it's almost a no-brainer, but at the same time, it's, it's high risk. Uh, if you get it wrong, you, you run the risk of, you know, of being wrong in the court of public opinion. But I'd rather be wrong in the court of public opinion than to see lives lost as a result of waiting on making a decision. Because at some point, you will go beyond the point at which you can delay. And by delaying, you are choosing not to make a decision, and there will be consequences that storm intensifies. So uh, it's, it's a group effort, and I can't stress the amount of work, effort, and energy that goes into uh, making sure we're all on the same page with that. Was, was there, I know in South Carolina, according to the Hurricane Center report, uh, you had four direct deaths uh, from flooding, if I remember. Uh, was there any specific graphic that helped you communicate the storm surge threats to, like, to the governor, for example? Yeah, so with, with the storm surges, the storm approached that front right quadrant got pretty close to the Edisto Island area before it made that shift and turned uh, upwards. So I guess in terms of as it approached, it hit that curve of the U.S. coastline there. Uh, so we saw our, our greatest storm surge impacts in the Edisto region prior to the storm making landfall. Uh, by the time it had gotten to the, the same area that Hugo came ashore, uh, it, it, it lost some of its steam and was more of a glancing blow then. Uh, the, the P surge graphics that come out the, you know, prior to landfall, where you're dealing with probabilities of how high water could be above land, is, is critical. We pushed those out just as quick as we could to show folks what we could be dealing with in terms of potential. Okay, thank you. Uh, I didn't see who came first here. Uh, ladies first. I'm Liz Gunnison from the city of Chesapeake, and I was curious to know what tools you use to measure how effective your evacuation was and how confident you are in the numbers. Uh, it, it, they're mostly anecdotal, and it relates to traffic counts. So number of cars leaving with a rough estimate of how many people typically travel in a car during a hurricane evacuation route or during a hurricane evacuation. So very anecdotal, not uh, too scientific. There was uh, some of our county managers and, and local law enforcement agencies did go out and kind of canvas their neighborhoods prior to the storm to kind of see the number of lights on in a home type, type of approach. And it, it seemed to match. It looked like about half of the folks chose to stay uh, despite the evacuation warning. Again, dealing with a glancing blow storm, folks watching it on TV, Georgia hadn't declared an evacuation yet, maybe South Carolina is overreacting. All of that was probably playing. Uh, and it definitely was playing in the social media environment. Uh, trying to stay ahead of social media and any fire chief, police chief, or public official that had an opinion on what this storm was going to do and voice that opinion on social media, th there was a follow-up with a, you know, a state voice on social media to either back up what they were saying or to refute their potential uh, claim that the storm was so something different than what it was. So we, we had a, definitely had to address it on the social media uh, platform as well. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Grant Brown. I'm from Gulf Shores, Alabama, and represent municipal government. Just a comment on your state, county, municipal coordination of a, of a potential and eventual evacuation. We had a late season storm, can't remember the name, maybe Ida, 
in fall of 2015. And the local uh, EMA county and our cities were discussing when is it time to evacuate, is it time to declare, is it time to get our tourists out and then talk about the low-lying residential areas. And unbeknownst to us, the governor chose to declare an evacuation south of a particular highway, Highway 98, which is an entire zone um, that probably would never have been evacuated. And so there was really lack of communication between the state level, county level, and our municipalities. As you can imagine, we were uh, uh, stunned when we, were cho when we had to choose to either um, support the governor's declaration, which of course we have to because that's the way that the flow of the government works, but in all essence, there was you know, truly, uh, it was overreacting in our opinion, and it really proved to be very difficult for us to manage from our municipal um, local level. So that coordination is absolutely vital when you sit at the, when your residents are looking to you as a city to figure out what they should and shouldn't do. So, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, Mark Schauer from Corpus Christi. Uh, did any of you do anything special with your homeless population or your homeless shelters or your nonprofits that handle homeless? Because we have a significant population of homeless in Corpus. And I just kind of wondered how they managed or did they just kind of get absorbed somehow? I can hear his question. Um, I've talked to some counties about it. I mean, uh, there's uh, very good notification systems. Uh, a lot of counties. Uh, take the time to learn those those local populations. Uh, I've talked to a lot of counties, they do find out, even though folks may be homeless, surprisingly, there's a lot of them with cell phones, so if there's even ways to be able to notify them, but um, a lot of it's just getting out the message that there, you know, something dangerous is coming and that uh, these are your options for seeking shelter, so. I've been out of the Hurricane Center for over 10 years now, and, uh, how about a little discussion on the hurricane liaison team? You talked about uh, uh, Florida and South Carolina impacting your shelter space in Georgia and it's the, the FEMA, National Weather Service uh, hurricane liaison team that's at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, can somebody uh, tell us how that worked? So, when you, especially when you're dealing with homeless population, you're talking about transportation needy and many times as well. So. Part of our mass transportation planning piece is at the local level, they're using the RTA buses uh, at pre-designated pickup points to move folks to shelters. Uh, so this was really our first chance to deal with the coastal evacuation since Floyd. So some of those plans were untested and they were also in transition where the, the old plans dealt with a kind of a state-centric, top-heavy sending buses into the impacted area and pulling folks as far away as the other side of the state to get to, to manage the potential transportation needy or, and or homeless uh, population groups. Um, we were in transition to try to make it more of a local effort using RTAs and RTAs moving to designated shelters or at least pick up points to move them a little bit further back. Uh, so that's a, the messaging to that population is I think where the real challenge is. How do you get the message that it's time to evacuate to somebody who doesn't have a phone, doesn't have a home, yeah. isn't plugged into radio or television? That's, that's where the real challenge is, I believe. Uh, what, we, what we experience, and I'm sure other states did as well, is that definitely impacts your shelter transition when you're trying to move out of the emergency phase, get your schools back open and your communities running. If you've incorporated a, a large percentage of homeless population within your shelters, it's, it can be very difficult to close them. And so then you're, you're trying to move, manage that process to get your schools open, transition the shelters, and, and try to provide as much assistance as you can. And we did experience a, a few shelters that we probably stayed open a week or longer as a result of, of some of the homeless population that it was a, a better situation than they had before the storm. So trying to deal with that. We had similar, similar results in Savannah uh, as to South Carolina with the homeless population hanging, uh, continuing to stay in uh, the shelters. And, uh, I, and it's understandable. Uh, the bigger problem we had was with transportation with uh, long-term care facilities and hospitals. Uh, that, was, that was probably a long pole in our tent. Add a piece to that. Um, our governor announced 24 hours prior to the evacuation order that she was leaning in that direction, that more than likely within 24 hours we would evacuate. Uh, 
uh, folks remembering Floyd and the, some folks being trapped on the interstate for 26 or 36 or 46 hours uh, decided that on their own that they, they'd gotten their cars and left early. But that put them on the road at that critical point, that 24 hours prior to the evacuation order, the same time our hospitals in nursing homes and others were doing their evacuations prior to, their mandatory medical evacuations. We did uh, had to evacuate some of our long-term care and, and hospitals in those vulnerable surge zones. So with increased folks on the roadways prior to the, the evacuation order, they experienced some delays in their transportation of getting folks to their pre-designated drop-off points at uh, neighboring long-term care facilities or hospitals. I put them on the road longer. It challenged their logistics of being able to care for the folks, and there were some patient care issues upon arrival because of the length and time that it took to evacuate prior to that evacuation being in, in effect. So we didn't have as many resources out because it was 24 hours prior. More folks chose to leave in advance, and the traffic delays we experienced, we wouldn't have experienced had the lanes been reversed. So there was some, it did create some challenges for us as well, but it was manageable, but it, it definitely did extend the time frame. Anyone else? Uh, let me go back to that hurricane liaison team question just to let the audience know how the states, one way the states coordinate among uh, each other uh, through that hurricane day something Matthew I mean uh, Andrew well the there's the hurricane liaison time there's also the evacuation liaison team calls that we do um, there's certainly a lot of coordination uh, with this we know uh, our evacuees are not always going to stay in Florida we know that they are going to go to the great state of Georgia and sometimes unfortunately a little further so uh, whatever we can do to help coordinate that message so there are conference calls with the hurricane liaison teams uh, we work with our FEMA region four uh, partners and help coordinating that. Um, our traffic counter information is available online. Florida 511 has real-time traffic monitoring. So uh, it's it's a great great tools and technologies, great coordination uh, to be able to give uh, folks a heads up. One thing uh, we saw in uh, Matthew with the evacuation versus Floyd and Hurricane Floyd, a lot of folks evacuated taking I-95 getting into Georgia. And since I know there's been a lot of changes in the plan, so we were able to see a lot of the Northeast Florida evacuees first take I-10, go west, and then at the I-75 interchange, kind of split the difference. A large chunk came to Tallahassee, and unfortunately a large chunk came into uh, Georgia, but by providing those uh, online uh, access points for the uh, traffic counters in Florida 511, you could see the uh, the volume of traffic coming in, and I know you had, you set up your uh, the visitor information centers and try to give messaging on where to route, where to route all our Florida evacuees. So, and like I said, we'll try harder in the future to convince them to stay in the state. Thank you. Add to that, uh the role of the state level emergency management director is is vital in that multi-state coordination piece. We had, you know, our director was calling Brian Kuhn and, and Jim Butterworth and Mike Sprayberry daily just to talk through, hey, what are you thinking about? What when are you gonna make a decision or when will a decision be made? What's your timing? Uh, so informally, state director to state director, there's a lot of coordination that's taking place prior to prior to that storm making landfall that is vital because we're leading the programs in each state. Yeah, we're so. calling into your circle. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's give all the speakers a hand.